So this is module two of the Blue Book PSAT, and specifically this would be the harder version of module two. And we'll just go ahead and get started here with the words in context questions. And as always, we're gonna focus on the passage, use the clues in the passage to come up with an approximate answer, and then let that guide us to the correct answer among the four choices. So logically, a damaged damaged fossil should provide less information than an intact one. But for this paleontologist, a broken area on a fossilized trilobite, a crustacean-like creature, so something like a, a lobster or crab, uh, maybe like provided, you know, it gave her or provided or offered. So notice here how uh, you don't have to come up with the exact word. And I like it for, for explanation purposes. I like it more when I don't come up with the exact word because it shows that, hey, you don't have to do it. You just get a rough idea and then look for the one that matches it. And that's going to be a lot more effective than trying to take the different answer choices and plug them in, especially plugging them in before understanding the passage. You know what it's saying. Okay, and we're going to do the same thing here. Even though we have this word underlined, we're going to treat it like a blank and not get distracted by it. Okay, so what a night it was. My soul had left its body to lose itself in the wild, unrestrained beauty around me. From where it came, from where its soul had come, I guess, and only left a trembling suggestion of its existence within me blah 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 so something like a trace and again you know here's why I say crossing it out because if we played word association and I said suggestion the first word that would come to mind would not be trace but a trace a faint echo something like that and how about that um, I don't think I saw that um, but again, an echo, um, a remnant, a fragment, something like that. But it's definitely not an opinion. But notice here that, you know, if you were to think about, in, in general, the word suggestion, you might think about an opinion or a command. Uh, I'm not sure about a dispute, but it's never, it's never, on these questions, it's never about what the word means in some general, vague sense. It's always about how it's being used in the passage. And uh, the more difficult questions, it's going to be a less obvious kind of, yeah, usage of the word as it is there. Bicycle sharing systems allow users to rent a bicycle at one location within a city and return it to any other designated location in the city, which can cause serious problems of supply and demand within the city system. This person uses these tools to identify when a high number of users making one-way trips when that high number is likely to leave some locations within the system. And here I'm just going to be really kind of broad or say full of bicycles. Full of bicycles. And that's obviously not going to be the correct answer, but it, the correct answer should be a synonym of that. And it's going to be saturated with. Saturated with. So D is the opposite of what we want. That would be, you know, if they're depleted, the supply would be insufficient. Contingent on means dependent on something else, and susceptible to means vulnerable to, like susceptible to disease or something. Uh, but saturated with and full of is the match there. Main purpose. Early in the Great Migration of 1910 to 1970, which involved the mass migration of black people from the southern to northern United States, political activist and Chicago defender writer Fanny Barrier Williams was, that's a funny name, um, was instrumental in helping other black women establish themselves in the north. Many women hoped for better employment opportunities in the north because in the south they faced much competition and men tended to get agricultural work. To aid with this transition, Barrier Williams helped secure job placement in the North for many women because before they even began their journey. So the purpose is to sort of uh, talk about this person's uh, role in the Great Migration. 
and that it was a positive role. Okay. I think A looks good. A looks good. Again, we're looking for the main purpose. And as their circumstances changed, well, there was a transition. That's a change. So A should be our correct answer here. But looking at the others, that's... Mm, I don't think it does establish that. Yeah, she she wrote for it, but it doesn't say anything about using those connections. It's not trying to demonstrate that the factors that motivated it were different. It's it's more like the the um, issues that they faced were different. Hmm. No, it's really more like the conditions for them in the South were different, but it's not the factors that motivated it being different. I mean, yeah. And to write it over, you know, it's, no. It needs to mention that person. And so that's going to be A. Again, with the main purpose. A number of indigenous politicians have been elected to the United States government since 2000 as members of the country's two established political parties. In Canada and several Latin American countries, on the other hand, indigenous people have formed their own political parties. Well, that suggests uh, some kind of contrast, compare and contrast between the United States and other countries in North America, other parts of North America. It's not one movement. It's not making an argument. Two approaches. Yeah, it's going to be C. What are the two approaches? Um, running as members of the established political parties on the one hand versus creating their own political parties on the other hand. So that's two approaches. Two approaches. It's not saying that one has influenced the other once again with the main purpose. The following text is from this novel. Uh, Anne, an 11 year old girl, has come to live on a farm with a woman named Marilla or Maria. Anne reveled in the world of color about her. Oh, she exclaimed one Saturday morning, coming dancing in with her arms full of gorgeous boughs. I'm so glad I live in a world where there are Octobers. It would be terrible if we just skipped from September to November, wouldn't it? Look at these maple branches. Don't they give you a thrill? Several thrills? I'm going to decorate my room with them. Messy things, said Marilla, whose aesthetic sense was not noticeably developed. You clutter up your room entirely too much with out-of-door stuff, and Bedrooms were made to sleep in. So we definitely have contrasting personalities and then we also have uh, disapproval, you know, disapproves of Anne or Anne's behavior or Anne's actions. So we don't see anything about a newly developed appreciation. Get some geese in the background. It's we don't know that this is something that ha that often happens. So that would be what I'd say against B. Hmm. This could be one that I miss. C versus D. To emphasize her disapproval of how she has decorated her room or to show that they have different personalities. Did I somehow subconsciously pick up on that <laughs> uh, when I was screenshotting these? I don't know, but let's see. The main purpose... Yeah, I think this one is tough because, I mean, okay, the main purpose, the big picture, what is the point of it? Yeah, that's tough. This is almost a coin flip for me, but I would say probably the big picture point, and that's what we want to focus on with the main purpose, would be their personalities. 
whereas this is sort of something used to illustrate it. Now the thing that makes me a little skeptical about D is whenever you see what I'd call this an amplifying word, you know, to show that they have very different personalities as opposed to just different. When you have an amplifying word, it does make that answer choice a little harder to support. It needs more evidence, but it does say, you know, her aesthetic sense was not noticeably developed, whereas Anne reveled in the world of color about her, meaning that she did have a developed aesthetic sense, sense of beauty or visual, um, yeah, beauty or, you know, I think that's close enough. And so I would go with D, but I think that's a pretty tough question. That's a pretty tough question. Seven. So our first paired passage question. So how would the author of passage two respond to the conclusion reached in passage one? So in a study of the benefits of having free time, Marissa Sharif found that the reported sense of life satisfaction tended to plateau when participants had two hours of free time per day. So to say that it plateaued would be like it increases and then it levels off. And it actually began to fall when they had five hours of free time. So that would be two hours. This could be no and that's going to be five. So that's the plateau. After further research, she concluded that this dip in life satisfaction mainly occurred when individuals spent all their free time unproductively, such as by watching TV or playing video games or games. Okay, so how would the author of Passage 2 respond to this portion? So this psychologist cautions against suggesting that an ideal that there is an ideal amount of free time. The desire for both free time and productivity is universal, but Maddox asserts that individuals have unique needs for life satisfaction. Furthermore, he points out that there is no objective definition for what constitutes productivity. Reading a book might be considered a productive activity by some, but idleness by others. Okay, so he would he would say that you know that people are different. So he would caution against uh, making a broad conclusion, but also that productive uh, is relative. You know, that it, you know, relative to someone's standards. You know, how do they consider it? Do they consider it productive or not? So something in in uh, connecting to either one of those two points. No, that's what the author of the first passage would say. I don't think it's about productivity contributing to individuals' life satisfaction, because it does contribute just as free time does. But warning against making an overly broad assumption as there is no clear consensus in distinguishing between productive and unproductive activities. Yeah, so he wouldn't he wouldn't categorize them one way or the other. It's more that Yeah, again, there's no objective definition. There's no consensus in distinguishing between productive and unproductive. Main idea. So modern dog breeds are largely the result of 160 years of owners crossbreeding certain dogs in order to select for particular physical appearances. Owners often say that some breeds are more likely than others to have particular personality traits, but these researchers found through a combination of owner surveys and DNA sequencing that while physical traits are predictably heritable, behavior varies widely. Okay, so within breeds. Something like that. To, you know, so to, to, to talk about dog breeding, but in particular to draw a contrast between physical traits and personality traits. 
So A is very absolute, and it does not say that, and that would not be the main idea even if it had said it. Research fails to confirm a commonly held belief about dog breeds and behavior. Well, the, commonly, the fact that it's a commonly held belief is here, that owners often say, but this research does not confirm it. So that would seem to be correct. It's not talking about which breeds are the most popular, and it's not saying that it's notable for its research methods. The moon with the eccentric orbit. And so here, this is an explicit detail question, meaning we just go into the passage and find what it says about that. Okay, in 2019, 20 previously unknown moons were confirmed to be orbiting Saturn. Three of the moons have prograde orbits, orbiting in the direction of the planet spin or the direction that the planet spins and the other 17 have retrograde orbits orbiting in the opposite direction of the planet's spin. All but one of the 20 moons are thought to be remnants of bodies that orbited Saturn until they broke apart in collisions. Although the one exceptional moon orbits in the same direction as the planet's spin, its orbit is highly eccentric compared to the rest. So highly eccentric. Eccentric could describe a personality, but here it's it's a technical term. So the eccentric one um, seems to have had a different origin. So different origin. Not the same origin. No, it's not that it's neither. See, it orbits in the same direction, so it's prograde. Okay, so it is prograde. It is likely the result of having collided with another body orbiting Saturn may not be a remnant. So, okay, it has a different origin, so we need to know how the others originated. So the others are thought to be remnants of bodies that orbited Saturn until they broke apart in collisions. So this is one that would not have been a remnant of a body that orbited Saturn. And so it would be D. So that's actually a little harder than what I was expecting, given that oftentimes with these based on the, the passage questions, it's just a matter of going in and finding one specific detail mentioned in one specific place. But that's not the case there. The main idea Several scholars have argued that conditions in England in the late 9th through early 11th centuries, so the 800s through the 10 hundreds, <laughs> uh, the thousands, uh, namely, these uh, conditions would be burgeoning or increasing literacy amid running conflicts between England's Anglo Saxon kingdoms and Danish invaders. These conditions were especially conducive to um, well disposed to, uh, beneficial to, helpful to the production of the old English epic poem Beowulf. And they have dated the poem's composition accordingly, meaning that these scholars think that it came somewhere between the 800s and the 1000s, or the 9th and 11th centuries. It is not inconceivable, so it is conceivable, it is imaginable or possible that Beowulf emerged from such a context, but privileging context over the linguistic evidence of an 8th or 7th century composition, so 7th or 8th would mean in the 600s or 700s, requires a level of justification that thus far has not been presented. So what they're saying here is that the linguistic evidence supports 
you know, a, a, an origin between those, you know, years, whereas the, the context, the contextual fit indicates that. So they're sort of at odds with one another. Although there are some grounds for believing that Beowulf was composed between the 9th and 11th century, advocates for that view tend to rely on evidence that has been called into question by advocates for an earlier date. I think that's a pretty good match. Because they rely on evidence involving context that has been called into question by advocates for an earlier date. But let's see. Although several scholars have dated it to the late 9th through early 11th centuries. Yeah, it's not about the social conditions. It's about the social conditions versus the linguistic evidence. Not C. Because, um, again, it's context versus linguistic evidence. Hmm. So A versus D here. Although there are some... Uh, tender, okay, and I think the issue with A, now that I look at it again, is that it's not... It doesn't actually say that that evidence has been called into question by these linguists. I really think the first parts of A and D are, are basically interchangeable that it has some plausibility, there are some grounds for believing it, so we really need to focus on the second part. Advocates for that view tend to rely on evidence that has been called into question by advocates for an earlier date, or advocates for the claim have not addressed evidence suggesting an earlier date. Those are really close together, but the important thing here is, you know, it requires a level of justification that has not been presented. They have not compellingly addressed the evidence suggesting an earlier date. So it'll be D, and so that's why we do want to make sure to read all the choices uh, and really put the microscope on uh, the, the, the options that remain once we've eliminated the ones that are clearly incorrect. Again, I'm going to say that A is incorrect because it doesn't say that these advocates have actively questioned this. It's more that these advocates have not addressed the evidence that supports that conclusion. Which finding would most directly challenge the assumption in the underlying sentence? So first we need to understand the assumption in the underlying sentence as it relates to the passage as a whole. So although most songbirds build open cupped nests, some species build domed nests with roofs that provide much more protection. Many ecologists have assumed that domed nests would provide protection from weather conditions and thus would allow species that build them to have greater or larger geographic ranges than ones with open nests. So the assumption is that domed nests would lead to greater ranges, greater geographical ranges, and open nests would then have um, smaller ranges and so this person analyzed data and evaluated it but it doesn't say what the evaluation was so if we want something that would challenge it that means that these would be reversed meaning that the ones with dome nests would have smaller ranges so it's not about extinction rates not about the size of the birds. It's not about the materials. Okay, species that build open nests tend to have larger ranges than the ones that build dome nests. And so yes, that would challenge it because it would it would indicate the opposite of what has been assumed by many ecologists. I really think diagramming or even just making some brief notes on a question like this can be really helpful because you don't want to get, you know, mixed up and, and it's hard to come, sometimes keep these things straight when you've got multiple variables and one points this way and one points the other way, etc. So da data from the table that supports the student's argument. So we want to read the passage first. 
understand where the argument, uh, what the argument is, and then use that to uh, interpret the table. So native to Latin America, the cane toad was introduced to Australia in the 1930s. In recent decades, tadpoles in the Australian population have been shown to consume eggs of their own species. Ugh. Uh, a 2022 study showed that when presented with cane toad eggs, as well as eggs of native Australian amphibians, cane toad tadpoles disproportionately consumed eggs of their own species. This behavior results from their attraction to this chemical, a chemical produced by the eggs of cane toads, but not the eggs of native amphibians. Ugh, very dense passage here. So using data from a study, a student wishes to argue that the presence of that chemical doesn't explain their preference for certain eggs over others. Okay, so the presence, okay, so percentage of available eggs eaten by these tadpoles. So this tells us that the, okay, the higher the percentage, the greater the preference. Okay, so certainly the one that does produce it they are they like it because they eat 90 percent of of those eggs but i think what we want to do here is look for for ones where there is you know either no difference well i mean there's no they don't produce it but there is still some difference i think that's really the key that that um because with yeah I circled the ones but we don't really want that I would say we want to, we want to compare we'd want to compare you know the fact that that these don't produce the chemical and they only eat one percent of the eggs whereas these don't produce the chemical either but they eat ten percent of them so certainly ten percent is less than ninety but ten percent or even seven percent is different than one percent. And so, yeah, I'm going to say that we need to compare something about the short-footed or striped burrowing frog with the little red or dainty green tree frogs. Striped burrowing. Yeah, A. They consumed a higher percentage of the striped burrowing frog eggs than they did of the dainty green tree frog. And it's really hard to, to show all this at once because it gets really small and blurry, but that is what we want. Um, they left a certain percentage of the eggs of each of the five species unharmed, so that's, that's not important. We want to compare the actual percentages. They consumed a lower percentage of the short-footed tree frog than they did of their own species. That wouldn't help it because, or that wouldn't il illustrate the point because there, the difference is between not producing it and producing it this would um, yeah it would be kind of irrelevant or it would go against the student's argument and then here D is comparing those two but see there is no difference and we want to say that oh no nope, the presence doesn't entirely explain the preference because again here are two different ones that don't produce it and yet there is still a difference in the preference uh, the degree of preference and so that would be a support the conclusion so we want to see what the conclusion is so the intertropical convergence zone or ice tcz a band of clouds that encircles earth in the tropics and is a major rainfall source shifts position in response to temperature variations across Earth's atmosphere hemispheres. Data suggests, I wish data were considered singular. It should be, but data suggests that the ITCZ shifted south during the Little Ice Age, but a shift as far into South America as Higuapo 
should have led to dry conditions in Central America, which is inconsistent with climate models. Okay, so, so it shifted south, but the question is maybe how far south? Did it go into the northern tip of South America or farther? Okay, to resolve the issue, this geologist and colleagues collected data and compared them with this other data. They concluded that during the Little Ice Age, it may have expanded northward and southward rather than simply shifted. Okay. Okay, so if it's in Peru... They're not expecting us to, to know, to be able to find Peru on a map, but, but it's in South America and Central America is north of South America. So, boy, I've had to do a couple of these maps and they're not good, but I'm going to say South America, Central America, just for our purposes here. Okay. So. They're saying a shift as far into South America, should, this far, should have led into Central America. They conclude that it may have expand, expanded northward and southward. Okay, so they're saying that wherever it was before, it went both directions. And that could have could account for the fact that you don't have these dry conditions there. So maybe something that suggests that rainfall was similar in Central America and South America. It's not about temperature. The okay, Yak Balum data is down here. And the Huagapo data. They concluded that it may have expanded north. Yeah, I think we need something that indicates that that conditions were basically similar. Strongly correlated patterns of high rainfall. Yeah, okay, and again, what is the reasoning here? It's if it had shifted as far south as they thought, that would have led to dry conditions in Central America, and that's inconsistent. And so what they're saying is that, well, in, if instead of shifting it had just expanded, that would mean that both of these areas would experience relatively similar conditions, or at least correlated conditions. And so if expanded northern, northward and southward, both of these areas would sort of fall under the... Hmm, same influences and that's what so again and we're looking for rainfall not temperature because I don't really see him talking about temperature um, I also think it would be weird just to have increased temperatures during the little ice age um, and C is the opposite we, we would expect them to have similar conditions not different and so number 14 here is one that I initially uh, must have skipped uh, in terms of screenshotting, so I'm splicing it back in here. So I logically completing the text question. Some, we'll just call this AM, some AM, a river-dwelling fish found in northeast Mexico, have colonized caves in the region. Although there is little genetic difference between river and cave AM and and all members of the species can emit the same. Okay, so this sentence could have been, I think, written a little more clearly. Although there is little genetic difference between river and cave <laughs> versions of A. mexicanus and although all members of the species can emit the same sounds. Okay, so Let's do a little diagram here. This is confusing, so or potentially confusing. So cave and river, meaning the variance of the same genus and species. Uh, variance isn't really the right word, but um, what else could we say? Uh, it's a river-dwelling fish. Okay, uh, they have, some have colonized caves, and so although there is little genetic difference between them, and although all members can emit the same sounds, this biologist 
and colleagues found that the context and significance of those sounds vary by location. For example, e.g., I can't remember what that stands for in the, the Greek or Latin, but anyway, I think it's Latin, but it means, for example, uh, the click that river-dwelling AN uses to signal aggression is used by cave dwellers when foraging or looking for food. Okay, they found that the context and significance of those sounds vary by location and that the acoustic properties of cave fish sounds show some cave specific variations as well. Okay, so gosh, the writing in this one is challenging, but we're going to say the same species but different, uh, you know, communications in, in the sense that communications in the sense that you know they use different sounds or the sounds that they use have different meanings so the researcher notes that differences in sonic communication could accumulate to the point of inhibiting or making it difficult for these fish to interbreed suggesting that they could become different uh, species. Okay, something like that. Um, they're drifting apart in a sense, but yeah, so this is one that I imagine is going to give some people some challenges um, just based on how it's written, which I think it could be written more clearly, but let's move over to the answers. So it does not say that. It doesn't say that one relies on sonic communication less than the other one does. It says that they all use the same sounds or can emit the same sounds and that the context and significance of those sounds varies. It could be in the process of splitting into distinct populations. Yes, so it is a single species, but if it gets to the point where they can no longer communicate, then interbreeding could be uh, jeopardized or, or could be, you know, could become no longer possible. So I think it's going to be B, but let's check the others. So although all of them emit sounds, the fish living in rivers produce some sounds that, no, that is directly contradicted. All members can emit the same sounds. And then D, although the ones from different locations can currently interbreed, river fish and cave fish are significantly or sufficiently genetically distinct that they can be considered dis separate species. And no. And so here is something to emphasize. is One thing, you know, with these logically completing the text questions, you never want to conclude something that directly contradicts a premise in the uh, passage or some evidence. And they are assuming a little bit of knowledge of biology here, but genus species. So if they are all of the same genus and species now, it would not make sense to consider them separate species. So notice that D is making a much stronger statement than B. And D is not supported. It could be in the process of splitting in distinct populations with this different characteristics and then eventually if they can no longer interbreed, that's the point at which they could be considered different species. Again, getting into some outside knowledge from biology, but one of the uh, determining, uh, one of the criteria for a, a species is that, you know, the members can interbreed. So this one is going to be B. And again, um, I had just initially uh, neglected to screenshot this one. That's why it looks different, but we'll transition back into the previously recorded material with number 15. Okay, a standard Argo float, a type of autonomous robot, measures temperature and salinity, saltiness, in the upper regions of ice-free oceans. More advanced floats can measure a wider range of blank and monitor seasonal ice zones. Okay, they can measure this and monitor that. So we've got two 
mm, verbs and we don't need any punctuation in between there oh never mind <laughs> there there's this is actually the third in a list so yeah they can measure a wider range of variables travel to greater depths and monitor seasonal ice zones so we have a list we have a list and we want to use the commas now the only time you would want to use anything other than commas with a list would be if you had a a complex list like a uh, uh, one involving um, where the items being listed contain commas. So, you know, we visited, whoa, we visited uh, Columbus, Ohio, Bloomington, Indiana, and Springfield, uh, Illinois. Okay, so there we've got three items, but each of those items. Uh, contains a comma and so there you use a semicolon but and they have tested that on the SAT the digital SAT but we don't have that here so we just go with the commas answer choice B this one is going to be looking at the looking at the answer choices I can see already that we've got three plural options and one singular option so it's probably going to be D, but it's um, probably going to be a subject verb agreement question. Let's see. Amplifying the voices and experiences blank. Yep. So they love to do this with subject verb agreement questions. They take the um, subject and separate it from the verb. And then if your subject is singular, as it is here, they like to put some put plural nouns in between the subject and the verb to potentially distract. So you have to be really careful not to fall into that trap. But uh, one thing that can be a clue is that, you know, if your correct answer is singular, as it is here, they will often give you three plural options as incorrect answers and vice versa if your correct answer is plural they will often give you three singular but why is our subject singular here because our subject here is amplifying this would be an example of a gerund you know an ing word that's behaving like a noun uh, amplifying was it's kind of like saying walking is you know walking is a form of exercise uh, jogging is not fun etc so amplifying was of importance and so answer choice D is going to be correct there on sunny days dark rooftops absorb absorb solar energy and convert it to unwanted heat raising the surrounding air temperature adding a light colored covering to an existing dark roof helps combat this effect so would this would be an example of a boundaries question as they call it and i think the best way to go about these is to focus on where you have independent clauses um, or if you only have one independent clause but here we've got multiple independent clauses the first one is going to be that dark roof the rooftops absorb and convert as there are subject and verbs and then this portion here is is going to be a, a phrase a participle phrase raising the surrounding air temperature and then it, it's initially kind of hard to see where the next sentence is going to start but we eventually do have a second independent clause Sometimes it's easier to kind of pass over the middle part and then come to the end here. So um, adding adding 
helps combat this effect. <laughs> so that's another example of a gerund and um, adding. And initially, we don't know whether that's going to be a subject or not, but yeah, adding. adding a light colored covering to an existing dark roof and then this portion is an interruption either by doing this or by doing that but adding helps combat this effect so the important thing here is that even though we have a phrase in between these two independent clauses we still have two independent clauses and if you're not connecting two independent clauses with a comma and a conjunction such as and for and nor but or yet so you need something more than just a comma so in other words, our correct answer would need to have something more than a comma. Now, the problem with A here is that it's going to turn that second part into something that's not an independent clause. By adding a light colored covering to an existing dark roof, blah blah blah. See, we don't end up we don't actually have a, a proper pairing of subject and verb, whereas if we take out the by that's going to work. So the, the difference here, the important difference is not that because the semicolon and the period are going to be interchangeable. So in order to choose one of these over the other there has to be some difference and again that difference here is is the by that we don't want and so answer is going to be C. So yeah, really focus on where your independent clauses are in these kinds of questions on these kinds of questions I should say and here I'm we're just gonna note before even delving into it that we've got two that can be eliminated because these two are identical except for the period and the semicolon and then of course the capitalization so both of those are going to be out so we just need to decide whether we need a comma or not so the haiku-like poems of so-and-so, which present nature and dream-influenced images in crisp, spare language, have earned the Swedish poet praise from leading contemporary writers, among them Nigerian-American essayist and so-and-so. Yeah, so we definitely do need a comma. Why? Um, his poems... have earned praise from writers among them this writer okay um, hmm. how do we articulate this um, I mean there's it's certainly we don't want to make a rule or try to try to pretend that there's some rule that you always need a comma before the word among because that's not true you know it was difficult to find my friend among the crowd or to locate my friend among the crowd you wouldn't need a comma there but um, I guess we could say that this would be a kind of you know among them this essayist that would be a kind of a positive or interruption, a non-essential portion, because you could have just ended the sentence with writers. And so, yeah, I guess that's what I'd say, but definitely eliminate A and B, or A and C in this case, because of the period semicolon rule. Punctuation with some parentheses mixed in. So in addition to advocating for South America's independence, Simon Bolivar personally led armies against the Spanish, liberating three South American territories from colonial rule. Okay, so speaking of interruptions, this is going to be an interruption here. And it's um, going to extend up to... Okay, <laughs> so... I'm going to say, okay, we, we would never want to do that. You would never put a comma right before a parenthesis like that. Now, you could have a comma after it. You don't always need a comma or punctuation after it. But in this case, it's going to be the dash because that's going to, to uh, match with that punctuation mark. And um, 
I think I mentioned in the video for part for module one that with punctuating when it comes to punctuating interruptions you generally would have three options either a pair of commas a pair of dashes or a pair of parentheses but when your interruption is already kind of complex like it is here and it already contains both parentheses and commas that's where the dash can come in handy I mean even if the interruption just contained commas then using dashes around it can be can help clarify where that interruption begins and ends but uh, yeah here the main portion of the sentence would be what I have in red he led armies and in doing so liberated three South American territories from a colonial rule and so because that starts with a dash we need it to end with a dash and so our correct answer would be D another standard English conventions question to serve local families during the Great Depression this person offered storytelling in both English and Spanish an uncommon practice okay so again with the independent clauses so this person arg this person did this stuff and then what we have here would be a little uh, it looks like the beginnings of an interruption but but what I notice here at the end of the sentence is that hmm we have a semicolon I think what they're doing here is they're they are presenting a complex list uh, this is going to be a kind of parallelism question the the person did one thing offered this celebrated this and put on this so I think we're gonna need a semicolon yes okay so what is going on here yes so that's um, yeah, I was initially thinking there was going to be a second independent clause and actually I should just keep that in red yeah okay so this New York City librarian one offered storytelling in both English and Spanish which was an uncommon practice at the time two he celebrated the day of the Magos and then, uh, the three magi maybe and put on puppet shows so one two and three and so I think I was alluding to this earlier um, that if you do have a complex list that's where the semicolon comes into play and so yeah our answer there is going to be B did not realize that was coming okay this one has to do with answering a question and I have a video a recently made video on this and I'll try to link to it if I can remember but what we have here is uh, well it says they launch themselves at such a high speed they travel up to two meters before landing how how something 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 a layer of micro bubbles on their plumage or feathers reduces friction so it looks to me like they're actually asking a question and then giving the answer so how are they able to move so fast and this is not what I was expecting in the sense that they often on these questions will give you two answer choices with question marks and two without them and yeah but that's not what they did here but how are they able to move so fast so a has the right words but it's missing the question mark I've never seen them give any questions about the use of exclamation points how they are able to move so fast that would be what you would use if you weren't asking a direct question like scientists do not know how they are able to move so fast period but see here it is a question because hey it's the whole sentence how are they able to move so fast so the answer would be D but I'll still link to the video about question mark questions or you can just search this channel for when when should I use a question mark that's the title of the video something like that okay transition word so back to transition word so like I said in the first video we want to focus on the passage specifically the questions that are being linked 
excuse me, the sentences that are being linked and think about uh, the relationship between those sentences. So, with her room-sized installation, The Interstitium, Iranian-American artist Leila Mehran succeeded in creating a space that felt both familiar and distant. Blank, with a video screen placed at the far end of the coal slag-encrusted room, her installation was reminiscent of a typical movie theater, albeit one found in a sub subterranean coal mine. So I think what they're doing here is they're making, uh, they're giving, you know, they're elaborating on what they've said. So are they giving, I don't know if they're giving an example, because if it's a room-sized installation, I mean, maybe you could say it's an example. For example, for instance, I guess that's what I would lean toward, but, um, mm. Okay, it's definitely not next, and it's not nevertheless, and it's not instead, so indeed, why indeed? Okay, why would we use indeed here? Well, because what they're doing in the second sentence, now that I look at it, is you could say that they're emphasizing the point made in the first sentence. She succeeded in creating a, fa a space that felt this way, in fact, Her installation was reminiscent of a, hmm, indeed, in fact. Yeah, I'm going to say that they're elaborating on it. I have a video uh, that I can link to, again, if I can remember, that talks about uh, a, a question from the paper SAT in which indeed is the correct answer uh, and how you might use it. But here I'm really using more process of elimination. But... Indeed, I will say that indeed and in fact are used to sort of emphasize or double down on the point made in the previous sentence. And that's kind of what they're doing here. Again, um, familiar and distant. It felt like a typical movie theater, which would be a familiar thing, but one found in an underground coal mine that would be distant or unfamiliar. And so, yeah, they're taking that previous point and emphasizing it. Another transition word question. In response to adverse environmental conditions, many plants produce abscisic acid, ABA, a stress hormone. It triggers a slowdown in the biological processes of most plants. Blank, it, it tr triggers accelerated growth. Okay, so this is a contrast. Most plants, it's a slowdown, but in this one, it doesn't trigger a slowdown. Whoa, I don't know what happened there, but uh, in contrast. So we're not drawing a conclusion, we're not giving an example, and we're not adding on. So yeah, so if you find a contrast, sometimes it's, it's almost like hard not to find yourself saying, but that means you probably found a contrast. Historically, most conductors of major orchestras have been European men, but a new, more diverse generation of artists is stepping up to the podium. Mexico's Alejandro de la Parra took over in this place in 2017. That's an example. That's an example. So what we're connecting here, we're not connecting the two parts of this second sentence. We're connecting the second sentence to the first sentence. And so it's going to be for example or for instance. And that's it. Yep. So in addition... See, okay, now you might ask, why why, why is it going to go there? Well, these are what you would call all of these transitional adverbs. And transitional adverbs, the same thing goes for however, nevertheless, therefore, consequently, etc. You don't use them to directly link to independent clauses, which is what these two things are, like that and that. So, you, so the transition word or phrase here is going to connect this whole sentence with the one that came before it. So they could have just as easily put, put it at the beginning. For instance, Mexico's blah, 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 and Colombia's blah, blah, blah. So um, that's the important thing here is that we're relating, again, that second sentence to the first one, not the first part of the second sentence to the second part of the second sentence. 
And finally, the rhetorical synthesis question. So the student wants to emphasize a difference between C-type and S-type asteroids. And we're going to see with all three of these rhetorical synthesis questions how close we can get to the correct answer without reading the bullet points. And I think we're going to be able to get the answers without looking at the bullet points at all. So we focus on these keywords, emphasize a difference. This doesn't emphasize the difference. It just says that they classify them differently. This just says what they consider when classifying it. This just says the percentages of each, whereas this one says, well, first of all, we have the contrast word, but these are composed mainly of carbon, and these are composed of silicate materials. It did not mean to zoom in there, but D is going to be our correct answer. So look for those signal type words like if it's a difference look for a difference and then uh, yep that's gonna be that 26 they want to emphasize the location so not where it was built it's got to mention a location and only one of these does that so it's going to be C. No more complicated than that. And then finally, the order in which the exhibitions were held. B doesn't do that. C doesn't do that. And D doesn't do that. So yep, all three of these questions we could answer without the bullet points. And this, uh, I'll make another video, or I'm, I'm working on another video, or brief video about pace. But you, you might notice that if we step back and look at, um, you know, how long it took to do the different types of questions, these are some of the quickest. These are relatively quick as well. And for that matter, the standard English conventions questions are relatively quick. The bottleneck comes in the middle with the strength and weaken and logically completing the text and data questions so if you're pressed for time or just you're concerned with being able to finish whether with your ability to finish on time and you can initially skip over those time-consuming questions go to the end you know do all those and then come back and um, that way you won't allow these time-consuming questions like maybe 12 or 13 to to prevent you from getting through the whole section or module. Anyway, we'll talk about that separately. Any questions on this module, leave them in the comments below. Hope you found this helpful and best wishes on your PSAT and or digital SAT uh, endeavors.